Hey, hello. How are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. If you don't mind, I'm going to get into some of the technical stuff that we talked about last week, which is we spend time talking about grants and film festivals. So for people like myself, most people have no idea what they are, when they are. And the way that you t- you talk to me about it, it's like second nature. It's like, bada bing, bada bing. I'm like, oh my God. It, you know, from, so could you give us like that timeline of what some of the film festivals are, like how you go, you can even use one of your documentary as an example too like uh, when does it start and what are some of the the downfalls yeah i mean uh it was, some of the stuff i wish i had known before i'd gone through it would probably be my experience dealing with film festivals and trying to get the film out uh, and seen so you know when when i finished my previous film my life in china um i had been sending that rough cut a rough cut of it around and trying to get into film festivals for like two years before i actually finally got into one Nobody told me that, hey, you should probably finish your film and polish it up as much as you can to make the best first impression when sending it out and trying to get into film festivals. The realization that film festivals already have films that are in the pipeline, films that their their organizations have already uh, supported and given grants to, you know, and they have partnerships with like, you know, a lot of the nonprofit organizations like Ford Foundation, Tribeca Film Institute, Sundance Documentary Institute or Sundance Institute, um, National Geographic. So all these all these places have already um, funded films and they, they already have the upper hand. So if you're if you're a film like, you know, like someone like me, I was ignorant and I, I was just like <laughs> swimming upstream with my my independent film. You know, you think, you know, there's independent films out there, but then there's really independent films that aren't part of that whole pipeline, you know? So, you know, I'm like cold applying to all these festivals without reaching it out and like, um, leveraging my contacts. Cause you know, when I had my first film, I had made a lot of contacts, but I, I didn't realize, wait, maybe you should keep contact with the people there and also stay on the radar and, you know, let them know what you're doing and where you want to show the film and all that stuff. Right. So they could at least, you know, drop a uh, connection, you know, na- you know, vouch for you at, at certain places, you know, whisper in ears for you so that, you know, you will get into film festivals, the certain ones that you're trying to get into. I, you know, I was ignorant. I had no idea. And for some reason, it never occurred to me until, you know, I got to a certain place in my life where, wait, this is what <laughs> it dawned on me. Like, what? <laughs> you know, all these films, all these films are in the cool club and they're showing up at all these film festivals that I'd love to be in. So, you know, you got to realize what you're going up against when, if you don't know anyone. So is it true, you name, I know you named a lot of really big names, National Geographic, Sundance, and is it also what you're implying maybe that people should start with some of the smaller and more local film festivals to start? Would that be a good idea? Maybe it's simultaneously applied to big and small, similar to the way we apply to colleges, you know, like the sort of... Yeah, yeah. but I wouldn't wouldn't recommend shooting low, you know, I would still try to, you know, pay attention to the the hierarchy of film festivals and the the season of film festivals, how it unfolds each year. Because, I mean, if you don't get in, you know, it's it's still worth trying to apply to those and trying to get in because there's a chance you may get in if if the work is good enough and there are people that screen it, love it, you know, and it just works its way up the the, the ladder in the system. If you don't go that route, you, you, um, it's, it's good to know how to go about it after that, you know, at least you would have had the entry. You didn't miss the deadlines for the big ones, but you still have that fallback of trying to get into the the middle tier ones and the ones that are more underground. You so know? what is the, uh, I guess, what is the upper hand, like the super privileged uh, festivals by names? What is the kind of the mid-level and what's considered underground? I mean, getting into Sundance because, you know, if you look at the calendar each each year, I mean, the the, the each Film year starts in January. It sort of falls the calendar, and Sundance actually falls at the end of January, right? So, people tend to try to time their their films, the completion of their films, for the end of you know August. I guess there's the Sundance deadline for the next year. So people are trying to plan their films around this kind of 
I don't know, it's kind of weird, you know, because everyone's trying to get into Sundance. So you want to finish or have a rough cut of your film by like end of August, first week of September. You know, if you're if they already know you, maybe they'll give you uh, like a extension of the deadline, you know, like September, mid-September. So then, you know, the, the you can have your premiere. So there's a big thing put on film premieres. So you really don't want to give up the premiere or you want to hold off and save the premiere for certain festivals. Like, you know, give Sundance prestige or if you want to premiere at uh, South by Southwest, which is, you know, after Sundance. Or if you want to premiere, if you don't get into Sundance, you're trying to get into maybe Toronto International Film Festival, which happens after that. Or there's Berlin International Film Festival, which is, you know, the I guess the second big film festival because it's an international kind of premiere. But then you also, if all those fall through, you, you know, you're trying to get into Tribeca. What, uh, you know, so there's sort of a pecking order going down the line over the course of a calendar year. So if if you don't get your uh, world premiere at Sundance, you're you're hoping for the you know next ones. It's really interesting that you mentioned filmmaker workshops, and it sounds like you definitely learned. Uh, they were helpful in a way, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's all these the organizations. They have these grants that pe- you know filmmakers can apply for, and they 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 put a big emphasis on first time filmmakers. So. If you, uh, you're going to embark on going on this journey, I would look at like Sundance Institute, like A3 Foundation, you know, National Geographic, they have an All Seeds grant. They have, you know, MacArthur Foundation has stuff. There's there's a lot of filmmaking foundations out there that are all about funding people if you have the right idea. So and I didn't know that, you know, so I, I wish I had, you know, not that I would have gotten any maybe but, but maybe you never know you you there you throw stuff on the walls and you, you may get stuff you know I've, I've gotten uh funding for my baseball film we raised three hundred fifty thousand dollars from scratch you know just by a sh- shot in the dark you know um for my high school baseball documentary we uh formed an llc and reached out to um, a foundation called the usjf um, that was based in New York City, United States Japan Foundation. And at the time in 2003, they were still giving grants out. I'm not sure these days if they're still doing that, but they were giving $50,000 grant to uh, productions that were making films that were promoting uh, J- Japanese and American relations. So our film, you know, I guess aligned with that mission. So we applied, you know, but it was like this one year kind of application process where we, you know, reached out, letter of inquiry, talked to, you know, told them that we were thinking of making a film about high school baseball in Japan and would they fund something like that? So, yeah, they were expressed interest and they invited us to make a a full proper application. We decided to go to Japan and uh, shoot a promotional video, maybe like a 12 minute preview like a sort of excerpt to try to get there okay to or give you know to give us a grant for the application so while we were over there you know we met with them in tokyo gave them a like a three minute promo piece and but then you know after six months of negotiations and application process we, we finally got the first grant so after being awarded the first fifty thousand dollars they were officially on board so now they wanted to see us uh you know, be successful in fully funding the project. So they went to bat for us, which is the amazing thing, you know. So they, they, they you know, approached the Japan Foundation, the JUSFC in uh, D.C., the Japan-United States Friendship Commission. You know, so we uh, subsequently got another two grants from them, uh, the USJF. Uh, essentially, we raised about $350,000 total to uh, make make this film about high school baseball in Japan. So, I mean, the toughest thing was getting the first uh, grant from the, the, the USJF Foundation. And after that, it was, it, things were easy because, you know, they sort of legitimized us. Like, oh, wait, this foundation is willing to give this film a, a grant. So why don't we consider it? You know, and like I think it was since, since they were like an official organization, they went to bat for us and sort of applied you know, and <laughs> kind of help. Yeah. Them. Well, what's really fascinating is that I always find myself, I guess I'm surprised. So are some of the listeners at this point that these foundations or these grants actually exist in the first place and you have to look for them. Obviously, I'm sure you start a documentary, not every grant's out there going to be supporting you because the the vision or sort of the message are different, but definitely worth looking into 
I mean, are you aware of any centralized websites for filmmakers that for people to be able to navigate, filter on what might work for them? You know, obviously applying to these grants will actually take a lot of time and energy too. So do they exist? Yeah, I would say um, to go through, there's uh, the website uh, by POV, POV POV.org, like the TV, PBS uh, documentary curation program. They're like the tops, I would say. And they have a page that has all the film festivals and foundations that documentary people should take a look at or apply to or consider. So, uh, you know, just search on Google about, uh, you know, look up POV documentary applications or something or resources. So then a, a page will come up and, you know, it's a really amazing spreadsheet of like information, different deadlines. But also, aside from that, I would take a look at your project and identify what kind of uh, foundations that would ha- have the same mission that your film would have. You know, like if you're making a film about uh, immigration, you know, illegal immigration or Cuban people or, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that, see what foundations are out there that ha- ha- have that kind of mission that want to talk about immigration, you know. You know, in my case, we, you know, we were making a film about Japanese uh, culture and uh, just the promotion of a better understanding. So, that we, you know, we found this uh, foundation that was, was literally the same mission. So or if your film or project doesn't have a foundation that it aligns to, look at certain potential foundations and just align your film to that mission. Yeah. So, you know what? Well, you also brought up a very important point. Uh, It's one thing to find that these grants or these foundations exist. The other is to pitch and to pitch it correctly. So... Mm -hmm. You had, uh, when I was talking to you um, last, last again last week, I was just still at the very beginning stage of the documentary. The way I pitched it to you was kind of, you know, I said something along the line of a bilingual, you know, China-born, uh, Amer- American, <laughs> sort of America-made podcaster. I think I have a kind of a quirky way of conducting some of the interviews, my view is also quite different than some of the uh, traditional American-born sort of podcasters. And I want to travel around the U.S., interview these people. I wonder, could you share with us a little bit about, you know, how they should go about structuring that message, that one pager, to make their pitch more compelling? Like, what are some of the critical elements they should think about? Yeah, I mean, putting a one sheet together is a good exercise to uh, really work out the film idea or, you know, the project and um, try to um, put onto paper, word to paper, uh, you know, have a clear idea of what, what you're trying to do. You know, it's a good exercise. And I, to, whenever I start a film project, I, I try to be able to put it down, you know, all the story points and be able to talk about it in a very succinct way. Um, that way, you know, you know that you can move forward with the film project because, you know, the, the idea works, but, you know, I mean, it usually starts with a free, right. You know, just brainstorming and just writing down, you know, in shorthand, just notes, of what, what you think the project should be. It doesn't matter if it's, it's not perfect and unraveling as you type it, you know, for me, it's part of the process of just working it out, you know, and, but at this point in the game, I know uh, what I have to do as far as, you know, the, the points I want to hit in a film, Wh- who the film's about, what's, what's the conflict, what is, um, you know, uh, what is the story, wh- who is this person, why they're doing what they're doing. You know, I have like a list of questions that I'm running down, um, just trying to be methodical about it, evaluate whether it's worth it to make a film or, you know, video project about something, you know. So you mentioned the word conflict. Like, can I want to know, like, how important it is to identify and to, and then how to articulate that conflict? It's definitely a piece of art. And it's, the question is really tough. It's as if I'm asking my mom, who's an artist, to describe what is a great piece of art. It's hard to really put in words, but like as a very new documentary filmmaker, producer myself, I find myself struggling with that. So like what, 
how should I, or how should anybody who's listening to this to approach it? Yeah, I mean, I would try to figure out if there's any changes to whatever subject, you know, I mean, I think a good clue is if things change, you know, if things stay the same, things are kind of boring. You know, does the character, does the person start uh, naive and then does it go, you know, go all the way to the other spectrum of being well-seasoned and uh, cynical, you know? Um, is there, uh, you know, is, is something legal and then <laughs> illegal, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, let me, let me think about it too. I mean, is it, the stake should be high, relatively speaking. Is, is something difficult, you know, is something a touchy subject, you know, that, you know, is there tension? If like, who wants to watch something really boring or a walk in the park where nothing is a challenge? So for example, like I think because you're producing so many films, like let's use a couple of examples, um, such as the the baseball, the the young boy, I assume fairly young, playing baseball in China. Um yeah. what is the what is the clue and the stakes there? Well, I mean, uh people always say that uh, you know, China's always changing and they've they've come a long way, but do they really know what they're talking about? So we're using our cameras to show a, a contemporary portrait of modern day China, you know, trying to humanize the Chinese experience. You know, China's at a place in their their existence where families, there's a new middle class, upper middle class where families can help choose the, the trajectory for their kids or kids can choose their own dream. Actually, they can choose to be a baseball player. Just, just a generation ago, people were just worried about food, but now, you know, the, these families are, have enough money and food to decide, Hey, we want to pursue sports and music, you know, intellectual stuff. So you know, the film also helps tell the story of Major League Baseball, who's trying to make tons of money, but investing in education and the culture of baseball, you know, so they're they're trying to do it in a, a very indirect way, you know, making tons of money. But, you know, we want to pose the questions, is it a good thing? Is it, you know, insidious? Is is it what they're doing? You know, is, is it a good thing? You know, so. Mm. Well, you also added to the list of that conflict and clue is I think you said pose a question to having a, a point of view, having an opinion. And yes. that really works well because your your uh, uh, audience will either agree or disagree. And that alone, you kind of attract people from both sides that people who disagree never stop watching necessarily, right? Like sometimes we even hate watch something. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of filmmakers that like to just put their point of view, but I'm the kind that likes to present a lot of different points of views. And But really the film should be, a, for me, a, a, a way to get people to join in the conversation. How, how can we have a civilized debate and try to hash it out so that we can, you know, determine, you know, what is good and what's bad? You know, how how can we wax poetic how can we intellectualize about um the good and bad things of things you know and another example i find fascinating kind of on the other spectrum let's um maybe use a hospice care documentary as an example because i definitely feel the tension there and it's something very difficult very challenging whether you know it is for the caretakers or for the patients and the patients families themselves but it also happens to be something that has existed for a long time it, it's a topic where many people avoid and uh, you know sort of then then what's the angle there how do you attract people to watch something that may scare them or to only want to think about it once they have to think about it like how do you attract the audience yeah, I mean, well, for hospice care, I mean, there's a, always a stigma that, you know, it, it's it's this place, you know, where you get taken away, you, you know, it's not away, it's away from your home. But uh, learning about home care and palliative, palliative care, you know, it's all about, you know, the care doesn't just start and end at the hospital. I mean, it's extended at, in, you know, pl familiar places, you know, places where there's family, places where you feel comfortable. Just being involved in this project sort of has been enlightening and uh, educational, um, and it sort of helped remove the stigma of this weird thing, this fear. I don't know. I mean, it's for we've been taken care of, you know, raised as kids, but then you know, when we become adults, we're sort of self-centered and sort of feel invincible and don't think that we need care. Also, 
So it, it's really the circle of life and realizing that, you know, we have to take care of our elders. It's just ongoing process where, you know, people are caring for each other. You know, you go from the parent to like the, the person taking care of for the elderly, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For the um, not just older generation, but also a generation from a different culture. Uh, I wish I knew much more about hospice care and especially palliative care when my dad was diagnosed with cancer and it was very difficult in the entire family and palliative care was not even an option or vocabulary that existed <laughs> during that time at all. So I think somehow through your own journey, your projects, you're doing something, you're really going a lot, a much, much, much beyond yourself. Well, I mean... I'm thankful for that, you know, I'm as a documentarian, uh, you know, I'm able to continue the work. And, you know, this is these, these videos that I'm doing for the Hospice Care Center are uh, commissioned works that will be at their anniversary. They're celebrating 40 years. So, you know, I'm able to, con you know, do this work, but also be brought into this kind of space, but also continue, you know, uh, be able to pay rent with this, you know, doing this kind of work. You know, for me, that's that's the big part of it. You know, that's, it's what keeps me going. Absolutely. And I want to close the sort of the conversation on something I was going to bring up at the very beginning, but in your director notes, you mentioned something which I highlighted is that as a first generation Asian American, it was a difficult decision to defy my parents' career wishes to pursue art. And the second part of that, it was an even tougher one to try to make it as a documentary filmmaker, which has been much of what we talked about. So I guess my question on that statement would be, you know, what would you like to say to your younger self? I don't know when that would be when you were 18 or possibly even younger when you made that decision to pursue art. What would you like to say to that young child? I would say, yeah, go for it, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I think part of the Asian American civil rights movement is to uh, appropriate all the different spaces. You know, like when we first came to America, we weren't allowed to do certain jobs. You know, we were gold digging. We were working the transcontinental railroads. Then they, they, they restricted us to only do restaurants, working in restaurants and or being a merchant, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, as, as we went along, as immigration opened up, you know, became, you know, got education and became lawyers. You know, eventually we had started serving in the military, getting, you know, uh, ha having elected officials even. So for me to be an artist, to appropriate that space is a continuation of all that, of Asian Americans being in those spaces and to really show, hey, we are Americans also. We can um, add to the, the, the you know, landscape um, the different kind of people <laughs> in America. To choose this journey is sort of existential, but also do the work is existential on many different levels to, you know, as an activist, but also to do the work to... Uh, to educate people or to, to help bring about better understanding and compassion. You know, it still took me a while to realize, wait, you have to find your voice as an artist. It's, it's, it's really what it's all about. It's not a film, you know, it's not just one film, the result, you know, of all this work, you know, it's about, you know, a big picture for me to, to try to build a career out of it, you know? Making that first film, I didn't realize. Wait, I, I need to be able to make another film. I need to have a end up with a body of work and continue. You know, so it took me far too long to understand. Wait, you want to be slow and steady, or just uh, maintain the course? You want to be self-sustaining. That's what uh, you know. I should be working towards. There are some people that will make the first film and make a bunch of money. You know, and all that. But you know, that's. Not that was not my journey, you know, as as someone that came from the poor community of Boston and that still, you know, financially challenged. I'm still at least I'm still trying to figure out how to pay the rent, but also continue uh, making creative work. So it's it's identifying what you can do with the opportunities you do to have and try to take it to the next level, you know. Wow, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Ken. I really appreciate your time and your knowledge and information. My pleasure, Faye. Anytime. Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode, and I hope you were able to learn a few things. 
If you enjoyed what you heard, it would be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Face Royal podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you're on your mobile phone, just search for Face Royal podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support.